What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your boy Nicholas here with Big Dogs Gotta Eat Fantasy Football. Today, we got a good video for y'all. One that's backed by popular demand. I figured I'd finally get it out there for you guys. It is my favorite fantasy football league settings slash rules. Some of these have to do with scoring types. Some of them are just the overall setup of the league. Listen, I've been the commissioner of probably three to five leagues every summer for the last... I don't know, as long as I can remember, maybe seven summers in a row, three to five leagues. It's a lot of leagues, I've had a lot of rules. I've dealt with a lot of different league mates, a lot of different scoring settings, whatnot. So I want to give to you guys my five favorite, I don't remember if I have five or six. I think there's five in here. My five favorite league rules slash settings that you guys can implement into your league. Because I think leagues and their rules and settings make or break your fantasy league. They really do. I think they play a huge factor in whether or not, you know, it's a good season and it's fun. So these are my favorite based on all the experience I have as a commissioner and I want to share them with y'all. <laughs> Numero uno, that is fab, fabulous. No, it's F-A-A-B instead of a waiver wire. What is F-A-A-B? That is free agent acquisition budget. So most leagues, probably 90% of leagues, I know the fab is getting more popular. Now, most leagues do typical waiver wire. One of two typical waiver wires. The first one is um, each week, you know, your, your waiver wire order resets based on the standings which is, first of all, a ridiculous thing because whoever's in last place keeps getting the top free agents. I just assume anyone who's like over the age of 14 is not doing those kind of leagues, and the only leagues that are doing those are people who don't know how to go into the settings and change those things. Second type of waiver wire is when you pick someone up, you know, as soon as you make the transaction, you move to the bottom of the list. So if you have 10 guys in your league, you're the most recent free agent pickup, you move to number 10, and that is your order for waiver wire, right? So you can't get the number one guy until you move back up or no one else puts a, a free agent bid in for that guy, and then you can take him. So there's flaws in both of those. I really don't like the waiver wire. I've been using FAB in most of my money leagues now for the last few years. Now, FAB is, as I said, free agent acquisition budget. What this means is in the beginning, and this is available on probably – I, they have it on Yahoo and they have it on most of the um, league formats. So you could probably implement this into your league. Fab is everyone is given a budget in the beginning of the year. It's a set budget. Everyone has the same um, same amount of money. It could be anything. It doesn't matter. It's all relative. $100, 200 1000 My favorite is uh, $100 because it's simple and it's easy to work with. So everyone gets $100 in the beginning of the year. And what you do is, you know, on the on the days that, free agents normally process in the waiver wire. Say, you know, you check your, your waivers Wednesday morning and that's when they would process. This is the same thing. It processes on Wednesday morning, except it's not based off of waiver wire order. It's based off of how much you bid on a certain player. It's a completely blind bid. So for instance, Le'Veon Bell gets hurt, right? Or, I, you know, let's say, um, who's a good hang tough? I don't know. I guess James Conner is the guy behind him. Let's just pretend James Conner is an incredible handcuff, right? Le'Veon Bell gets hurt. He's diagnosed six to eight weeks he's going to be out. Everyone knows the number one pickup that week is going to be James Conner. So what you do is everyone puts a blind bid in using the budget that they have. If they have $100, they can bid as much as $100. You can bid as low as $0. And on Wednesday morning, it processes. Whoever has the highest bid gets the player. You cannot see anyone else's bid, though, and they can't see your bid. So it's like person X bids $7, person Y bids $15, person W bids $44. The person who bid the most gets that player. Obviously that, that amount of money is subtracted from their budget and they're left with, left with like $56. And that's how, you know, that's how you get your free agents throughout the year. The only argument or the only kind of rough patch I've seen run into with this type of league is as soon as the blind bids process on Wednesday morning, what happens to the player pool? Now, you could do one of two things. You can do where all the players just go into the free agent pool, the waiver wire pool, and they're free to be picked up at any time like a normal waiver wire would be. I think that kind of defeats the purpose because, you know, it's – I think the blind bid should be in, in play at all points. You know what I mean? Because the blind bid ensures that it's not based off of whoever's like the quickie. Like say you're, work, you're in a league with people who work full-time. 
if uh, a player gets injured Thursday during Thursday afternoon, right? It's whoever is the quickest to their phone to pick up that player. I don't think that's right. I think the blind bid should be set up so that it's processing almost every single day, and that's what we have. Um, other than Monday and Tuesday, we have the the major blind bid, which processes on Wednesday. We also have it set up to process Friday morning, Saturday morning, Sunday morning. So you get a blind bid every single one of those days. So you have plenty of chances to pick up players. And I, what I think this does, in my opinion, is like you shouldn't be penalized for being good at fantasy football, right? You shouldn't be penalized for having a good record. So I, I think the waiver wire, that's a fault for that. And I also don't think you should be penalized for picking up players. I mean, that's what they're there. They're there for the taking. So you making a transaction move shouldn't move you down. I think the fab budget is the number one way that makes fantasy football waiver wires fair. So I would definitely suggest a fab budget over a waiver wire. And you could do that on Yahoo and you could do that on other sites that I've used. So check that out. If you have any questions about it, drop a question below, comment, whatever you want to do. Um, pro tip also, if you're going to implement the fab budget and it's your first year using it, what I've experienced is people who use it for the first time, their bids are going to be very low. They're going to be super cautious about bidding. If you give everyone $100 and it's your first year doing it, a lot of people are going to be cautious to spend more than like $8 to $12 on a single player. If a big player goes down and you want to grab their handcuff, don't be hesitant to, to bid somewhere from like 30 to 50 to 70% of your entire fab budget if he's going to be a playmaker. Like if a guy that you would have normally drafted in like round five is available, then you should be spending a heavy portion of it. So that's just a tip if you implement it this year. Number two after the fab budget is changing the quarterback scoring settings to either two quarterback league where you start two quarterbacks or have the quarterback scoring change to six point per passing touchdown and a higher penalty for interception. So either minus three or minus four points for interception. I think the QBs are just something that needs to be adjusted majorly in fantasy football. This is a big flaw, I think, in scorings and, and settings and the way it, the way the majority of people play nowadays. And this is from someone who preaches the late round quarterback tactic, right? Don't pick someone early because you could stream any number of guys. And that's, I want to get away from that because while it's an easy strategy to use, I think it's stupid because, you know, quarterbacks play an enormous role in real football, right? They're, they're the guys that are drafted, four of them are drafted in the top 10. They play almost no role in fantasy football. They put up points, but you don't, you don't have to analyze them. You don't have to research them. You don't have to make good picks in fantasy football when it comes to them. It's very easy. That's why I suggest changing it so that the scoring settings are favored more so towards quarterbacks and towards good quarterbacks, right? Drafting a, a QB in rounds like 10, 11, or like 15 has become so easy because even if you miss, there's going to be 8 to 10 guys on the waiver wire that you could stream at any given point. So what a quarter, a two-quarterback league does is, as I said before, that that's when you have to start at least two quarterbacks, or usually it's just two quarterbacks on your roster, or you have to start them. What this does is it ensures that a large percentage of your points do come from quarterbacks on the week. What it also ensures is that the waiver wire is not heavy with quarterbacks. Because think about it. Say you're in a 10-man league, and most people are even in like 12-team leagues. So you're in a 10-man league. Everyone has to start two quarterbacks. That's automatically 20 quarterbacks off the board, and you can guarantee that almost every team in your league is going to take a third quarterback just in case because the position came so important. So drafting a quarterback, drafting a good one becomes really important to you and you have to put the extra time and work in to see like who you want and you have to be able to hit on those later round quarterbacks right and if, if one of your guys gets hurt or one of your guys is a bust just like any other player if a running back or a wide receiver you draft early busts out it's got to be on you like you have to have the skill to be able to pick up a good one on the on the waiver wire or trade for one and that's what this does with quarterbacks because if 20 guys are owned or like 28 quarterbacks are owned it's slim pickings on the waiver wire my friends it is slim pickings and if your league is bigger you know then maybe two quarterbacks is not the way to go. Then maybe one quarterback league with better scoring settings is the way to go. I would suggest two quarterbacks. I think that's the coolest one. That's the funnest one. But if, if your league is hesitant to do that and they want to still play one quarterback, that's fine. I'm in a league that does that too. We switched to six point per passing touchdown. I suggest that you raise the uh, interception penalty as well. So it, what that does is like, you know, you have so many quarterbacks that like suffice nowadays, right? If you, if you take one of those late round quarterbacks, um, they'll put up enough yardage and eventually score garbage time touchdowns where you, that still doesn't change anything. And they'll still put up a good fantasy day just based on their overall statistics. Now, what this does is makes those late round quarterbacks look a lot less like rosy flowers and a lot more like rosy 
O'Donnell, right? You don't really want those guys on your team, let alone starting for you. Like, for instance, Phillip Rivers, 2016, finished as the quarterback six in fantasy, despite leading the NFL with 21 interceptions and leading his team to a 5-11 and record. You shouldn't be awarded in fantasy for being a terrible quarterback on the year. You know what I mean? Um, and being able to capitalize on garbage time and points that shouldn't really matter or don't matter in real life football. You know, it mitigates the garbage time points as well, I think, because for the most part, if you're in garbage time and your team is trailing by a lot, it's probably because your quarterback turned the ball over and threw a few interceptions, which by this league rule, if you have a higher interception total penalty, um, then that will come around and even things out with garbage time points. So, you know, I'm of the mindset that a shitty NFL player should not translate into a very good fantasy football player or at least bring his ceiling down a bit. That is... Um, what the overall goal of that is. So first rule, fab. Second rule is change your scoring settings for QBs, either two quarterbacks or one quarterback, but six point per passing touchdown and a higher interception penalty. Third rule, everyone should be doing this by now. It's half point PPR. This should be, half point PPR should be the standard setting, not to be confused with standard scoring. The standard setting for fantasy football, if you're still playing in a standard league, you probably still have a flip phone from Verizon. Like, I don't know what to tell you. Standard scoring is really boring. You should really try to get your league mates to change to half-point PPR. Uh, I think it's the perfect blend between standard and full PPR. Uh, full PPR also pisses me off because a player shouldn't get a full point, shouldn't be fully rewarded just for catching a ball, then falling to the ground. And that's what happens. You could have a negative two-yard screenplay in which you get the same amount for catching a ball and then gaining three yards in a half-point PPR. It's just, I think it's ludicrous, but I think half-point PPR is the perfect balance. What it does is it allows a, a bigger pool of players to be used, um, but not so biased towards the players who catch a ton of balls, right? Like Jarvis Landry is so valuable in PPR, but he's not really that great in real life. However, for running backs and stuff, um, guys who score a lot of touchdowns and are like the ground and pound guys, super valuable, but like a guy like Duke Johnson would almost never be used in a standard league so this is like a good medium, and it opens up a big pool of players, um, and it just expands the draft, and it expands your team's needs, and like guys you could pick up on the waiver wire. So half PPR is the perfect settle between both league settings, and I've you know I've been in some interesting leagues where tight ends are a premium, so you know it'll be like half PPR or full PPR, and then tight ends get like 1.5 points per reception, which is interesting, but like I don't know, that's really hard to judge and actually get prepped for your draft because you're like, ah, what are the right numbers to look at? Like, what should I be doing? But either way, I think half PPR is the way to go. Also talking about scoring settings in my E-Town Get Down League, the big one, we implemented a half point per first down this year or this previous year uh, for rushing and receiving. I don't know if we, I don't think we really liked it. We have a meeting every summer where we talk about the rules and rule changes. And I feel like that's going to be rescinded and voted back and not do that anymore. So probably wouldn't suggest that. But number four, and this is arguably the biggest rule change that you should make to your league if you're not already doing it. And this is keepers, keepers, keepers. Everyone should have some kind of keeper rule implemented into their league. It keeps the league engaged throughout the entire offseason and it changes the entire dynamic of your draft day which is very cool, the way if you implement it correctly, right? It could be a double-edged sword. If you do this wrong, it could be devastating to your league, but if you do it right, it makes it awesome. And there's two things to look at. There's, there's how many keepers can you keep. There is um, what are the rules, right? The jurisdiction for keepers. How early can they be picked and kept and uh, free agents and how late and things like that. So my opinion is too many keepers can absolutely ruin your league, right? If you go into the draft and like five guys are kept, that makes draft day really boring, right? Because you don't have as many players to pick from. I mean, I've played in leagues where anywhere from like one to five players can be kept. But I think the big thing here is when they can be kept. So in my E-Town Get Down League, we allow one keeper. Last year, it was prior to last year, it was two. We changed it to only allow one this year. What's more important is I think the keeper has to be some kind of late round keeper. You have to have a round cutoff because if you're allowing someone to keep anywhere from one to five keepers, but they can keep guys in the first three rounds, again, that makes draft day more boring because you're not able to grab guys like a Le'Veon Bell or an Odell Beckham or things like that, especially if you allow 
people to keep like three to five players and all those guys are off the board. That makes draft day so, so boring. So we've decided on one keeper allowed. Two keepers was good too. I like two keepers, but that's the max and it has to be eighth round or later. We originally played around with six round or later, uh, moved it to 10th round or later, which I like, but we didn't end up keeping that. We moved it to the eighth round or later. Now what this does, sixth round is too early because there's still a lot of guys that are really good available on the board in the sixth round and you don't really have to do your research in order to like hit on a sixth round guy. So the keeper league should be implemented to kind of pay off the people that have done their research, right? And draft well and draft well late in the drafts because that's when drafts are won. And if you can hit on a guy that's eighth, 10th round or later and they're like a big keeper option, like good for you. That's when you should be able to keep it. Now, the other key rule to take away here is that we do not allow free agents to be kept. If a player was not drafted in 2017 in our fantasy football league and he was on the waiver wire, someone picked him up, you cannot keep him. Every year, there are players that bust the fuck out, i.e. Alvin Kamara. And if you had picked him up off a of free agency, you know, you didn't have to really have done the research. He just picked up a good player at the time and you're able to keep him. You're basically going to the following year with an extra first round pick and you didn't even like go out of your way to draft him last year. And you could say like, oh, that should be the reward for someone who picked him up, you know, and like that's him doing the good the good work, you already got awarded for it. You were able to use him all of last year once you picked him up from free agency. So what this does is it it minimizes any ridiculous advantage that uh, a league member in your fantasy league can have going into the next year. So to wrap this up, I like late and no free agents. So anything like eighth round or later, and this will depend on your league size and stuff like that. Eighth round or later, one keeper is how we do it. And you guys can customize it to any number of players, any rounds. But I'm telling you, it makes the draft a lot funner when you don't let people keep, like, the obviously really good players. And that's more of, like, a dynasty league. You know what I mean? And this is different than, than a dynasty league. This is just keeper for one year. We let you keep him from one year, and then he's recycled back into the player pool. So even if someone did draft Kamara last year and they get to keep him for this year, he's automatically back in the pool 2019. It happened with one of my friends who picked... David Johnson and Jordy Nelson in like the 12th, 13th round last year or two years ago when we had the, the keeper rule at 10th round or later. The following year was the year that both of them, it was David Johnson was running back one, Jordy Nelson was wide receiver one. So that wasn't much fun for anybody. So we had to tweak the rules a little bit there. No free agents later in the draft and only keep a maximum of two players. That ensures that draft day is still fun. And keeping it engaged throughout the season is awesome too because you could trade your uh, trade your keepers or trade your draft picks or whatnot. So say you drafted really well, right? And you ended up with three guys after the eighth round that are all keeper viable. And you're like, ooh, I don't know what to do. You could trade one of those guys to another team for like a discount and they can keep them. And they trade you a draft pick in the, in the swap. So say you have like Kamara, 12 12th round, um, I don't know, Devin Funch is like 16th round, I'm just giving examples, right? You have to choose between two guys that you want to keep. And you're like, you know what, I'll just give, since I can keep Devin Funches for a 16th round pick, I'll trade him to you, and you can keep him, and you give me your 12th round pick, right? So you got an extra 12th round pick, you aren't going to be able to keep Funches anyways, and now you're in a better position. Drafting well does pay off in keeper leagues. The only thing I would say is you have to make sure that everyone goes into the draft with the same amount of roster spots. So say you trade Funches and you're already keeping Alvin Kamara, right? You're already one player ahead of everybody, and you get that 12th round pick for Funches, so you're one draft pick ahead. Just cancel out your last round pick. So you'll have two 12th round picks, uh, and you cancel out your last round pick, so you just make sure it evens out. Last, and also a very important rule, is this. Winners win, and losers lose. Now, I'm talking about what do you win? What does your league winner win besides pride, besides being able to shit talk, and what happens to the loser? This is very important. This will make your league way, way, way more engaged and way more fun. What do you want your winner to take home? My league, my big money league, we have the championship belt from fantasyjocks.com. They are a sponsor for today's video. I wanna say thank you first for sponsoring the video. They are the number one leader in fantasy championship belts, trophies, rings we have a ring that we give to a winner each year they have the draft boards the live draft boards um so i would also suggest doing a live draft but i didn't put that in here as one of the rules because a lot of people can't get around to doing that but either way you got to have something on the line other than just the money the buy-in so what i would suggest is if you you know if you're buying is 50 bucks have everyone throwing 60 bucks have everyone throwing 65 or 54 or something like that depending on your league size and what you guys want to buy and with that grab one of these things and boom like you know how <laughs> this is epic like when someone wins in my league and they have this belt 
They literally take it everywhere. They take it to my friend's house when we're watching football on the following Sunday of the next year. My friends take it to the mall, sometimes to the bar, just to piss us off. It's just like the greatest inspiration. You want the belt. You want the belt bad. And on top of the winning, you want to have a loser's punishment, man. Woo! This is arguably my favorite part of my big league. Every year when we get together to do the league meeting, we talk about, we throw out like eight to ten punishments that we want to have each year. And we narrow that down to one, obviously. That's like the funnest part about it is picking a punishment and you know there are a million different punishments you could use depending on your league mates and how serious you guys are three years ago you could see here my friend this was in the middle of january had to dress up as if he was going to the beach this honk if you're drowning last place in the e-town get down that wasn't that good of a one, but you know, I feel like every every league has to start off with something stupid like that. Two years ago, my friend had to redo the Shia LaBeouf video, just do it, you know, the just do it video. So he had to remake that. He actually didn't end up doing it, so we had to kick him out of the league. Last year, your boy had to do some stand-up comedy. Not last year, two years ago. Uh, maybe I'm getting the years confused. This was a few years ago. I had to do the stand-up comedy, five minutes in a New York City comedy club at, the, at an open mic. So that was, that was a good time. This year, uh, we haven't done the punishment yet, but the loser had to do become a bathroom attendant for a night. So we're going to go out to a club or a bar in New York City. We're going to talk to the owner make sure it's all right. And then my man has to dress up like a, it's the same kid who had his shirt off in the picture before. He has to be a bathroom attendant in the club while we're all there, like going out and, and you know, doing our thing. He's going to be in the bathroom, handing out paper towels and condoms and whatever they got going on in there. So... Our league motto quickly became, if you ain't last, you're first. Not if you ain't first, you're last, but the opposite way around, because you do not want to do that punishment. And, you know, we have some really funny ones, if any of you guys want ideas. I mean, there's obviously always the tattoo one, and you could take any of the ideas here. We have, uh, you have to dress up as a Jehovah Witness and, and walk around town for a few hours, try to convert people. The list goes on. Like, you and your friends can get creative and think of really funny ones, but... Regardless, a punishment ensures that everyone plays fully through the season because I guarantee you sometimes the last place battle is more enjoyable to your league than the first place battle is. And that race for the belt really don't mean shit when you're playing for a five minute open mic stand up gig. Oh man, it was actually pretty fun to be honest with you. Those are my five favorite league rules that you guys should implement into your league. Switching to a fab budget instead of waiver wire half point ppr two quarterback league or six point per passing touchdown plus a higher interception total keepers late round keepers no free agents and keep the number to a minimum so one or two keepers and then winners win losers lose make sure you check out fantasyjocks.com for trophies rings belts draft boards that is it for today thumbs up if you like the video you can go share it on all the social medias this seems like a very shareable video i think subscribe to the channel if you're new i'll be back with more fantasy football numbers statistics player breakdowns throughout the summer Oops.